what we decided to do today, uh, actually it, it emerged from conversations that I was having uh, first with Gwen Mellinger and then with other panelists about um, this problem that we all face in how to go beyond the official record, how to go beyond the archives and the published record to get at voices that are um, of everyday people. And this is a particular problem for those who who are looking at civil rights history and particularly media and civil rights history, journalism and civil rights history, because um, we can find the papers and we can find archive material for the publications and the movement leaders uh, and politicians and others. We, can, we, we know what they said and how they said it, but we have a lot of trouble um, finding the reaction to that from everyday people. How did communities interact with those arguments and the discourse that, uh, that those elites, if you will, the editors and movement leaders, what they had to say. And so um, we are uh, essentially four researchers who are dealing with this problem in very different contexts and different projects, but we thought if we uh, all came together and discussed our problems and got your feedback on how we're trying to address those problems, that might be a helpful panel. And so without further ado, we'll start with Thomas Jackson, UNC Greensboro history professor, author of a well-received book on Martin Luther King, From Civil Rights to Human Rights, and I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, and thanks for putting this panel together, Sid. It's terrific. Um, I will streamline a bit. SCLC Papers, President's Office, Series 3, 10,000 letters to King sorted in adverse and kind folders. Over 1,000 flooded into the office April, May 1963. That's double what they got the previous six months. It's an archival mother, mother load, obviously, for audience participation. They praise, they vilify, they're revolted by the repression, they justify it, they enclose donations to help, or they send news articles and cartoons justifying their positions, they tender lots of it. Advice. Uh, Lawrence Levine writes in The Folklore of Industrial Society that, quote, audiences are complex amalgams of cultures, tastes, and ideologies. They come with a past, ideas, values, expectations, a sense of how things are and should be. In popular music, Levine insisted there's simply no mechanical one-to-one -one correlation between producer or the thing produced and the audience. There can be no possibility of eliminating the contradictions and inconsistencies. Audiences respond with a language of argument not a chorus of harmony, all the more true in this ecology of communication between social movements and their leaders, policy actors at various levels of government, journalists and their different and competing market-driven media. They all interact with a public that is active, selective in the meanings they take away and saturated with memory. And they really have challenged what I thought I knew about a defining moment, the Children's Crusade, especially about the media's and the public's sympathy for nonviolent protests. A couple of quotes from uh, Roberts and Klibanoff and Julian Bond that I will skip. Basically, uh, the model is of crisis, confrontation, sympathetic news coverage, national response, conscience, and legislation. Okay, so uh, these generalities, they can still make sense in some sense, but they begin to seem mechanical. They're shorn of journalistic ambivalence, conflict, they're bereft of interpretive creativity, and actually the craziness of the American people. Uh, I've mostly examined press coverage up until now. Um, journalists clearly favored stories that captured violence or the dangerous provocations to non of nonviolence. They personalize movements through focusing on King's charisma or the sympathetic civil rights subjects that Ani Kobo-Dracosi writes about. They presented both sides in ways that are often limiting. They proved more more often fearful of divisions than they were devoted to justice. Uh, enough to say for now, they were empathetic toward oppressed Southern blacks, but deeply ambivalent about nonviolence as it edged toward provocation. And they're certainly not in control of their subjects, nor the responses of their audiences. A number of quotes from movement leaders I have here uh, to the effect that you know, we presumed Bull Connor would do something to help us. We had Huntley and Brinkley every night, or Bayard Rustin in New York watching said, Birmingham was television's finest hour where deeply visceral pictures seared Americans' conscience. Uh, let's have a look at the moving pictures of brutality, confusion, and potentially dangerous nonviolence. <laughs> I went the big news of the week. 
This is Birmingham, the South's mightiest industrial city, as the world knew it this week. These are the front lines of the battle between Dr. Martin Luther King's Negro Disciples of Nonviolence and the uniformed forces of Birmingham, led by Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor, who says, we were trying to be nice to them, but they won't let us be. The Negro leaders say this will lay the whole issue before the conscience of the community and the nation. <laughs> The scene is last Saturday. The sights and sounds filmed and recorded as they happened. The place is near the 16th Street Baptist Church, the starting point for Negro demonstrations. Negro and white in Birmingham had been building up to scenes to clashes like this. Tempers had worn thin on both sides. The situation was perilously close to an explosion. <laughs> Sometimes the Negroes were not able to contain their anger, to remain non-violent, and they fought back. They threw rocks and broken bottles. There were reports that some of them had knives and guns, but Negro leaders said those people were not their followers. They were, they said, onlookers drawn in by what they saw. There were injuries on this day, and the violence prompted an appeal from one of the Negro leaders the Reverend James Beale borrowed a police bullhorn and told the crowds to disperse if they weren't going to demonstrate in a non-violent way. Cut that short a little bit. Um, well, people consume the news on their own terms with their own lenses. Uh, there's empathy in that, but there's also fog of war and a great deal of danger and a, a, a fear for, of division. Joan Blocker Shreveport, Louisiana. Dear sir, thank God for television. The whole world got a glimpse of what a Congo jungle is like when they saw the howling, screeching, frenzied mob of Negroes in Birmingham. Even small children. The adverse folders contain a pretty noxious mix of anti-Negro, anti-integrationist, anti-communist, anti-welfare animus. Many denounced all outsiders, especially the corrupt and vainglorious publicity hounds like King, duping Negroes into rejecting their natural place in the social order. Many avowed supporters were shocked at the extent to which nonviolence had gone beyond acceptable bounds, appalled at the use of children. Others urged King to concentrate on self-help in the context of gradualism till they proved themselves worthy of integration, or as another man wrote, clean up the mess amongst your face first before you agitate race riots. Few in the adverse folder had any faith in nonviolence. Boy, stop comforting the red, start proving your worthiness, stop acting like children. Hate only begets hate, violence begets the same thing, violence. The law is on our side, you say. Well, that's what the gangsters, Hitler, Castro, and Mr. K of Russia say. More polite segregationists had faith that the media and the nation's leadership would expose King and deflate his image. Failure, 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 De Plume wrote. Public is turning against you. 
Quote, the president has spoken out against the timing of your demonstrations as well as the use of children. The attorney general has also taken a good swipe at your methods. The public communications media also has taken the halo from above your head. Uh, he's relieved that white officials and the media are so skeptical of King's methods. And strangely echoing Ella Baker, he predicts that the media can unmake a celebrity leader as quick as they can make one. Quote, the image must be created. For you, it is necessary that the community communications media be partial to you, yet true for now, but it was also once true for Castro. And he says, watch out, image, because you're heading for a change. Others decried King's media dominance and use of children as propaganda props. With much less faith in the media and dire warnings, Brigadier General Herbert Haldridge wrote, as for the fires, as the fires of racial emotionalism spread, fanned by the hysterical press, I, as a responsible citizen and public service, call you to account for your self-cast role as arsonist setting the blaze. A country faced an economic, a long letter, economic meltdown. King didn't seem to care about any other disadvantaged group, uh, he alleged. But now, quote, advancing through a racial forest dry as tinder under the hypocritical banner of nonviolence, but presenting no violent nonviolent solutions, you throw your own innocent children as lighted torches to set that forest aflame, an act of such utter brutality beyond imagination, expanded to the level of heroism by an equally hysterical press. Whew. Relief to get to the kind. Two minutes? Yeah, two and a half. So. Okay. Um, it's relief to get to the kind folders, right? Uh, they're simpler. They've got a fascinating mix of national and international shock and empathy. I found little reference to the goals of the march uh, or the May 10 partial victory. This probably reflects the paucity of press attention to those goals. Uh, watching the repression on TV kept one New Jersey woman, Mary Woodfalk, in a state of perpetual insomnia. She advised safety precautions. Carry Baptist and American flag, she said, and maybe they won't attack you. And if they do, their bestiality and lawlessness will be all the more exposed. Uh, fewer than half of King's correspondence specify the media of com communications through which they learned of Birmingham's brutality. But when they did, they mostly mentioned images and words drawn from newspapers and magazines and not television. Birmingham might have been television's finest hour for Bayard Rustin watching it in New York, but TV certainly didn't dominate the media for Americans concerned enough to write to King. Admit admittedly, those most likely to write to King might also get their news from other sources than TV. I didn't expect to find this. Newspaper and magazine readers voiced outrage, admiration, acute awareness of dynamics of publicity, a sense of history being made. As Reverend Clayton here says, the press here in Baltimore seems to be with you, etc. Well, um, the pictures are much more, in a sense, compare it with the, with the TV. You can linger over the pain and justice. They're sharper. There's less fog of war. There's more Negro hurt. Even the captions suggest there's hatred. Still, like CBS, life's editors framed the first frightening pictures in terms of both police brutality and Negro provocation. As they made clear in their final notes, their paramount fear is of widening divisions, not of the potential for further delays in justice that's too long denied. Mail from abroad placed the Birmingham movement in the highest moral plane. We were deeply shocked when we saw your incident in the lovely pa local paper. J.K. Kirobe from Kenya wrote, um, your troubles are just like ours. The Union of Australian Women, Guilford, New, so New South Wales, savage police dogs d d against defenseless children, et cetera, et cetera. A Cuban man sent $25 for su gran cruzada por los derechos humanos. Um, writers were more were acutely aware of the damage Birmingham was doing to America's Cold War image. Uh, is this this guy? Well, I think. Um, one writer, Thomas Butler of Washington, showed King how he could spin the Kennedy brothers' attempts at international spin of the uh, in new context of heightened confrontation. Uh, Butler referenced Bobby Kennedy's 1961 response uh, to the Freedom Riders' Mother Day riot that was broadcast over Voice of America, accenting the nation's progress Bobby had predicted a Negro president in 40 years. When his grandfather came to Boston, Bobby said the Irish were not wanted there, and now his brother was president. Butler writes in a little more militant tone, the minority peoples in the US have always had to fight 
to attain their place in the sun. The Irish faced a long, hard drive in the face of bigotry and hatred. He ends by praising the undaunted courage of Fred Shuttlesworth, and he hopes the triumph in Birmingham is the entering wedge of a Negro voting rights revolution. Um, most striking, zero. Okay, most striking are, are, are letters from Jews, um, and their response is is more moving, it's, it's in a sense deeper, and so is their commitment. Uh, Paul and Lula Berlin, demonstrations Los Angeles. As a Jewish family who's lost many loved ones in the scourge of Hitlerism, the least we can do is join hands with our Negro brothers and sisters who are fighting the very same pestilence. Um, wow. Uh, here's the last one. Meyer Brown, president of the Fairman Labor Zionist Order, sent $100, that's $800 in today's money, for the bail fund as a token of our admiration and complete solidarity. They had recently celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising against the Nazi beasts. Violent armed rebels, uh, rebels who, quote, stand as a symbol for freedom-loving people everywhere, including the nonviolent people of Birmingham. Thank you. Um, as Sid said, we've been uh, talking about this for a long time, and one of the things that I'm interested in, um, my research continually takes me to um, issues involving the way in which um, white Southern editors um, dealt with the um, unfolding of the civil rights movement um, and how they responded to it, and then also how their um, readers um, uh, respond to it. And um, so we started talking and thinking about this, and um, I have these thoughts. As media historians, we're the people who tell the stories about pe of people who have told stories in the past. In our spe specific subgenre of history, our subjects are historical actors who concern themselves with civil rights, and for most of us, that means the mid-century struggle for and against African American civil rights. Though the movement was refereed by the courts and Congress, this was a grassroots struggle waged by average Americans, the sort of people who don't save their correspondence for donation to a public archive for the convenience of scholars like us. Archives, generally speaking, favor elites and structure bias into history. Their availability determines who becomes a historical figure of academic interest. This is nothing new. We've known this all along. Uh, as historians, we have an ethical duty to make sure that we don't focus only on the elites who were predisposed to document their place in history. In the case of civil rights history, we can't do the honest intellectual labor of historical investigation if we focus only on elites whose papers are maintained in libraries and historical societies. To do so would be to ignore the very people who took sides in their local communities, whose identities were being reinvented by changes in the law and social custom, and who had a stake in the outcome. For a very good reason, most civil rights history focuses on the social and political transformation experienced by Af African Americans. We tend to ignore white people or treat them as a segregationist monolith. This is certainly not an argument for the historical redemption of white people. Many white people in the civil rights era were ignoble or worse, but we can't tell the story of, the African, of African American activism without acknowledging the elephants in the room. A tip of the hat here to a book called There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Civil Rights. Do you all know this? Um, by Jason Sokol. It's an engaging book based on interviews and archival material, but mostly on analysis of news accounts. Um, and he, he pr brings all this together to provide a nuanced but certainly not apologetic portrait of the white Southerner. A limitation of the book is that, is that he encountered a paucity of um, archival material, and this forced him to rely, um, in my opinion, a bit too heavily on news reports and other secondary sources. Uh, but it's an important book on the grassroots white response to the civil rights movement, and I recommend it if you haven't um, held it in your hands. Turning to our own work, the question becomes, where exactly do we find the voices of average white people discussing their honest views on race? There are indeed public archives where letters from white people provide insight into their views about civil rights. Granted, this limits the pool of source material to people who wrote letters. 
Um, but these archives provide a more accurate source of white sentiment, I would argue, than a short quotation in an inverted pyramid news story. This research objective requires the historian to look for non-elite voices in government archives and among the papers of elites, since the non-elites don't have archives. And it requires the historian to be strategic in identifying where these incidental letters from non-elites will be located. First, a few words about government archives. Whereas some African Americans may have been less comfortable <coughs> writing letters to authority, white people, by and large, had no problem doing so. Because some conservative white people were concerned about uh, communism and race and had faith in the FBI, some wrote letters to J. Edgar Hoover to express their concerns. I found an interesting assortment of citizen mail and field reports in the FBI file on the Highlander Folk School, the Integrated Activist Training School in Tennessee. For example, one cit white citizen informant was a retired minister who was alarmed that blacks and whites were mingling at High Highlander and by the amount of mail, some of it airmail and from foreign countries, that he observed in the post office that Highlander was receiving. He reasoned in, his, in a letter to J. Edgar Hoover that anyone who held biracial workshops and got that much mail um, had to be a communist. Oh. And he was happy to explain his views to Mr. Hoover and to the field agent who was dispatched to interview him. And there's a lot of this stuff in the FBI files and it's just in there wedged in uh, among other stuff. Many white people also wrote to their congressmen. The correspondence archives of demagogues may have a certain flavor, while letters to less incendiary uh, elected officials probably represent a broader range of opinion. It may be useful for some projects to investigate the sentiments expressed in letters to a governor, legislators, members of Congress. An example of the effective and detailed use of these, this type of archive to construct a historical narrative about white public opinion is Jeff Wood's book, Black Struggle, Red Scare, Segregation and Anti-Communism in the South. Second, the archives of white newspaper ed editors are an important source of white popular sentiment. Uh, people who took the local newspaper developed, um, at least in their own minds, a relationship with their editor in many cases. They also probably knew him. Um, just saw him at, um, walking down the street and knew him and he knew they, who they were as well. Although newspapers received and selected for publication formal letters to the editor on issues of the day, editors also received mail from members of the community who did not want their views published. Where this correspondence is preserved, it can provide great insight into how white people were thinking about African American rights, segregation, and the prospect of integration, and how they were responding to news coverage about race and civil rights. As with the archives of elected officials, the political orientation of the editor will influence the sentiments expressed by people who were compelled to write him a letter. For example, the reader correspondence in the Thomas Waring papers in Charleston is decidedly more pro-segregation than the letters in the Virginia's Dabney papers at the University of Virginia. Speaking of Dabney, during a recent afternoon in his papers in Charlottesville, I came across a group of letters from the mid-1940s in which white people expressed various opinions about race, racial disparity and their growing discomfort with it. Several of these letters were significant for media history because they represented reader reaction to editorial positions taken by Dabney, who was editor of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And they showed that some white people thought that he could be a sounding board for their views about Jim Crow and his and their community. I'll quote from a few of these letters here. In, 19, in February 1945, a woman named Alina Booth Taylor, a native Virginian living in Kentucky, wrote to say, Harry and I are just back from hearing Dr. Rufus Clement, president of Atlanta College for Negro People, speak here in Berea. In the course of a thought-provoking talk, he mentioned having been in Richmond recently. He had two hours of wait in the station for his connection. These he preferred to pass standing with his back to the iron grill while he read rather than stay downstairs in the filthy wait waiting room set aside for colored people. As more and more people crowded onto the platform waiting, there was a baby's cry of distre distress. Someone reached down and brought the child safely out of the dens densely packed group. Dr. Clement saw the child separated from its mother saw that the child separated from its mother was colored, the good Samaritan, a lovely young white person. 
Forgive me for turning to you, but for the honor of Virginia, I would like to see the colored waiting room a more attractive place until that intelligent moment comes when all such labeled waiting rooms can go out of existence forever. There also was in this batch of letters one from a woman who had um, observed that a bus driver, um, an African-American man, um, was approaching the bus. The bus driver closed the um, door on him um, and wouldn't let him in. Um, and she, the woman um, sent Mr. Dabney a copy of her letter of complaint to the local bus company, um, turning the bus driver in and, um, and um, so forth. Um, but she also is saying things like, we are rather fortunate here in, in Richmond in the class of our Negro people, and it is probably partly due to the fact that we try to be somewhat fair in our treatment. Um, so she's still um, evolving. Um, the most interesting letters in the strain of correspondence involved the family feud. Captain Thomas Morell Jr., a young doctor stationed in Europe, had written Dabney a long letter um, to the effect that he would be returning to Richmond after World War II having undergone a racial transformation. Uh, or at least in his thinking. Uh, Captain Morrell wanted to take on African-American patients in Richmond. He wanted to start an interracial choir. He wanted to invite Marian Anderson and Paul Robeson to perform in Richmond. The captain's father was alarmed and also wrote De Dabney of, quote, the deadly fear I have of a boy highly trained in a field which even a wonderful person such, I'm sorry, the deadly fear I have of a boy highly trained in, in one field endangering everything he has um, by working um, enthusiastically in a field that um, is not likely to, to bring success. The father implored Dabney to intervene, and Dabney wrote Captain Morrell at least twice, attempting to reason him out of taking up the cause. Dabney's response, a defense of the status quo, provides a counterpoint to the captain's activism. In addition, we find Dabney, who was widely regarded as a racial moderate, in a candid moment. Quote, all of us have to remember that we must not go so far as to cut ourselves off from our own people on whom we depend for suggestions and encouragement. We must try to be reasonably progressive and forward-looking, but not get so far out in front as to be in the position of fighting what, you, what is um, almost a lone battle. That afternoon in the archive in Charlottesville taught me a lot about how some white people in Richmond viewed Jim Crow a decade before it was outlawed. Gathering this perspective of regular white folks is time consuming because these letters are located throughout an archive and often turn up in unexpected, unexpected places and just a few at a time. Sometimes you get lucky and find a group of letters as I did in Charlottesville. More often such letters are the intriguing isolated finds that we stash away for later use on a project not yet begun or maybe not even imagined. Certainly, if we believe in moral absolutes and right and wrong and in human decency, it is easy to see segregation as a one-dimensional evil. But from the historian's vantage, that position cannot be applied to the decades in question without triggering presentism. And so I would argue that until we listen to these voices as unpleasant and jarring as their perspectives often are, we can't truly understand the complexity of white opposition to civil rights or how deeply imbricated into American culture segregation really was. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Is my voice coming over the mic? Okay. All right. Um, so, um, Yes, when Gwen first talked to me about this panel idea, the timing was perfect because she said, we want to think more deeply about where we can find everyday voices. And I had just found this case that I'm going to um, focus on today. And so it's a research in progress, and I'm going to talk about this particular case and then hopefully two others if time allows. So. I love my title, Sid wrote it, thank you. <laughs> but there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, for, for those of you who don't know me, I do most of my work in the legal historical area. So I'm in the archives as much as I'm in um, the court records. So my starting place may be, um, yeah, thank you, might be um, LexisNexis or Westlaw. 
And so I'm at a university that doesn't have a law school, so that can be a little problematic, but I do what I can um, in this area. But what I want to talk to you about is not so much, let's see if I can make this work. Yeah. yeah, okay. Not so much about newspapers. We do spend a lot of time as historians um, looking at secondary literature and what's in um, the, the newspapers um, of, of the coverage that we're considering. Instead, I want to um, talk about this document. And I don't really expect you to read this. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. And this is something that I came across, um, as I mentioned before, when Gwen and I were talking. And so um, in terms of everyday voices in court documents, this comes from the NAACP's digitized um, files that ProQuest put online. Who has used these? Oh, you're going to be so excited when you go home and you start using these if this is something you're interested in. I almost had a stroke when I found these. Say it again. Oh, it is the NAACP, and I'm going to circle back around to it. ProQuest digitized those records, they're keyword searchable, in, in 2014. So I'm going to circle back around that in, in a minute. I'm going to circle back around. Yeah, it's keyword searchable, the finding aid. Right. And then you order the microfilm. And because I'm at Ohio, Ohio State has a copy. So they just shipped it to me from uh, Columbus down to Athens. Um, but it, it has been really exciting for me. OK, so, so the everyday voice I want to tell you about. On a Monday night in April 1967, Mary, Rosemary Harris called the New Iberia, Louisiana Police Department when her husband Lester came home drunk and started beating her. And so what happens next is her voice through a statement she makes the next day when she goes to the local chapter of the NAACP and she tells them what happens to her. So she says in her words, Two policemen came, and one of them told me I had to go, too, down to the jail. They took both of us. They took her and her husband, Lester. She, won't, she expected the police to take her husband away. Hopefully, he would sober up and then um, be back tomorrow. But they, they put her husband in an interrogation room, according to this statement. And Rosemary was in another interrogation room. She heard Lester yelling as he was being beaten down the hall. And this is in these records. And then in her words, she says, after a while, a big fat policeman came in and started asking how many children I had. So I told him six. And she explained that one of her children was a teenager and lived um, with an aunt. And then a, um, another five lived with her. The officer had seen her small baby um, when they went to pick up Lester and her um, when they responded to this disturbance call. Rosemary, who was 28 at the time, kept asking to go home because her sick mother-in-law and her baby needed her. She didn't expect to have to leave the house that night. The police officer, Lieutenant Henry Dorsey, quizzed her about her work. She told him that she cleaned, in her words, a white lady's house four days a week and worked another job washing dishes at a cafe down on Center Street. He finally, the officer, stood up and he said he was taking her home, ignoring her protests. And she says in her own words here again, in the first place, I didn't have any business to go down to the courthouse because I had called for help. So. Dorsey violated, Lieutenant Dorsey violated police regulations when he took Harris home alone that night. Policy dictated that two officers must accompany women um, when they transport a woman in a squad car. Driving toward home, Rosemary later says, the police officer propositioned her for sex. Quote, he asked me if I could fix him up. I told him no. He said, now come on and let's not lose time. So he carried me on across the road past Hopkins, I believe. It was dark, I couldn't see. He told me to sit close to him. I was scared of him. I asked him if he was going to kill me out there. He took her to a deserted spot, she's not sure where. And he told her to get in the back seat and take her clothes off. Quote, I didn't take, I didn't take everything off. I just took my pants off. I was crying and scared and he told me to raise my leg up. I told him that was the first time something like that had happened to me. I'd never been in jail. I'd never been involved in trouble. I'd, and when I've called for help, I think I should be the one getting the help. And it didn't go that way. I was so scared, my heart was beating fast. I'm still nervous. So she's telling this the next day 
when she goes to the NAACP um, chapter for help. And so to me, I thought when, when Gwen and I talked about this, I thought, wow, everyday voices. And so, yeah, I was looking at microfilm of the NAACP papers and thought, wow, her voice came through through the court documents, okay? And so ultimately that's where I'm, I'm getting um, with this particular story. So the day after the rape, um, the NAACP leaders in New Iberia said they weren't surprised, that there had been rumors um, that Lieutenant Dorsey in particular, but a couple of other officers from the New Iberia Police Department um, down in South Louisiana were known to force black women to have sex. They knew they finally had it now. They've got the evidence. They've got um, information from Rosemary and that they could finally um, press charges. So the NAACP meets with the police chief and they demand Dorsey's suspension pending a rape prosecution. And they held lengthy, tense meetings um, with uh, uh, city officials. The New Iberia district attorney um, said he would not file a rape charge because she did not fight him physically. And so what ends up happening is um, they, they, Dorsey is suspended for, from the police force for conduct unbecoming an officer. And so the district attorney did convince the New Iberia grand jury to indict Dorsey for simple battery and kidnapping. And so ultimately what happens is Dorsey goes before the Civil Service Board to appeal his, sus his suspension. Um, and the Civil Service Board says, no, um, we're, we're going to keep him, uh, we, we want to reinstate him um, and keep him on the force. And so this was met with a public outcry, marches from the NAACP um, locally. And so... Um, the idea that the word rape isn't even used in any of the court documents until much later um, was really pretty shocking. But um, after the, the NAACP protested, the local chapter, the Civil Service Board met again and reversed itself four days later, and they said, let's make sure that he is suspended until trial. Um, and if he's exonerated, he'll get back pay. And so... Um, Dorsey ultimately, while the case is ongoing, um, decides that he is going to sue the NAACP and the mayor for $1.5 million in damages under a federal law, ironically called the Anti-Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, a Reconstruction Era um, Civil Rights Statute. And so this case will wind its way um, through U.S. District Court in Lafayette um, to the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans, um, which rejects this wholeheartedly, thinks it's ridiculous. Um, but Dorsey's claiming that he's been deprived of his due process rights and equal protection under federal law for being suspended. And so he argues that the NAACP and other city leaders conspired to get him fired. Ultimately, um, what he really wants is $392 in back pay, plus the million in uh, punitive damages and another $500,000 for embarrassment, humiliation, and mental anguish. So New York Times versus Sullivan, 1964, um, obviously um, that was also a suit relating to police brutality. And so Dorsey's very savvy lawyer out of Lafayette, Louisiana, um, knew this felt like libel, but knew that libel wasn't going to work anymore by the late 1960s. And so, um, as I just want to kind of pop through some of the uh, uh, last um, few records here, this is finally called a rape case in the NAACP records. And what happens is Dorsey ends up being found um, not guilty for the simple battery and kidnapping um, um, case that is winding its way in Iberia Parish's courthouse. And he remains on the job until his retirement about 15 years later. And so I just wanted to mention um, that the, the court records are fabulous and can really show you the voices of everyday people. And so I wanted just to suggest that you, um, whenever you are doing any kind of research and we think about what John Dittmer and other uh, uh, scholars call the local people, the court records are a fabulous place to go. Now, if you try to interview the local end NAACP in New Iberia, Louisiana. Now, they're going to point out that Victor White was shot in 2014 when he was handcuffed 
um, in the back of a police car and the police say, no, it was suicide. How in the world did he get his gun? Think of the gymnastics with that. And so they want to talk more about what's happening in 2015 um, in New Iberia, Baton Rouge, of course, all of the other places post-Ferguson that have, have moved into our national consciousness, consciousness today. And they, have, they don't know about um, the case of Lieutenant Henry Dorsey and of Rosemary Harris. And so um, I want to circle back around to um, this because the oral histories are there. Now, Rosemary Harris doesn't live, is, is not alive, but I am in the process of reaching out to um, some of her family members because I would like to try to do some oral histories down in Louisiana later this spring. But this is what I was telling you about um, the NAACP papers collection, digitized finding aids through ProQuest. And why I love this so much is because you could keyword search police brutality and then there is a wealth of information all the communications between all of the attorneys who work for the NAACP all of the affidavits court records etc and it looks like this and I don't expect you to read this either but it's a detailed discussion of all the records that are available and so for the first time then you're able to keyword search for the topic that you need and um, one last thing before I close and so I point out that this is um, the U.S. District Court records is what I was talking about because it was a federal case relating to civil rights issues. Um, so also spend time um, in the local courthouses um, wherever your subject may be because it's really fun to show up at a clerk of court's office um, and say, I would like to look at your docket from 1963. And they think, what? What do you need this for? And so, so, and so you, sometimes you do find someone with the heart of a historian in those courthouses. And so there are many opportunities to go dig in those dusty boxes that were sealed in 1964. And they're dusty and they're the, the, um, the, the tape is still on them. And you can go and dig through with that, with that surge and, and thrill that nobody else has been digging through that since they sealed them up um, those many years ago. And so I just urge you to spend some time with LexisNexis, Westlaw, and the legal section of the NAACP papers. Even though you might not be a legal scholar, the, there is a great deal of information there. I encourage you to go and, and, and seek out that particular treasure. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish up, and I'm going to try to do this quickly so we can have time for Q&A and to talk about uh, uh, this. Bear with me. Okay. Um, so my particular problem stemmed from a book project uh, called Newspaper Wars. And it's about, it, it argues that the black and white press both played a more significant, more prominent role in the civil rights movement, the history of the civil rights struggle in South Carolina than had been um, uh, previously uh, uh, reported or um, uh, discussed. And I argue that the journalists on both sides were political actors. They were uh, not just journalists documenting the movement, but they were political actors. And the problem I had, uh, many problems, but one problem dealt with this newspaper, which was the black press, the primary um, black press in South Carolina. This paper ran, uh, the White House Informer, in one name or another from 1939 to 1954. And I'm going to be very sparse with the background, but I'm going to give you just enough so that my uh, discussion of issues makes sense if I can make the clicker work here. Let's see. Um, a key player here is Majeska Monteith Simpkins. Majeska Simpkins was a young activist during World War I. Uh, she went to NAACP meetings with, NAACP meetings with her mother. Uh, she saw a movement rise during World War I in South Carolina with the help of a black newspaper. A former supporter of Booker T. Washington, the paper changes, uh, embraces the NAACP and helps the movement. And uh, a young uh, high school age, Majeska Simpkins, is a part of this. By the 1930s, however, um, the movement has long since died out uh, in South Carolina. The NAACP listed uh, the chapters essentially existed in name only. Um, a, uh, you had, uh, after a white backlash, you had um, a uh, black community that was um, uh, a more accommodationist, cautious and accommodationist, had a leadership that was accepting white supremacy, uh, and uh, afraid of actually challenging it directly. And Majeska Simpkins thought this was 
wrong. And the way she wanted to try to activate the black community to uh, challenge white supremacy and Jim Crow laws directly was by adding uh, a what she called a fighting news organ to the NAACP. In other words, the NAACP would have essentially a newspaper that was completely embracing its uh, efforts and would actually try to recruit uh, and generate activism in the state. And she was looking for that newspaper along with a couple of other allies uh, in the late 30s. Uh, and she well, found, uh, she thought she found her man, and she did actually, in John Henry McRae. He was an editor in Charleston. He'd actually been working in an insurance company. He, he left that, decided to launch his own newspaper, the Charleston Lighthouse. He did this in 1939. Uh, Simpkins thought he would be great. He's a good writer. He's aggressive. He actually seems to like to be in fights. Uh, and that he would be good not only to challenge uh, white leadership in the state as much as possible in 1940, uh, but also to challenge the African-American community, um, which was a key role. Uh, and so um, she worked with some other allies, and they convinced McRae to merge his paper with a small paper in Sumter uh, and eventually moved the paper. Um, this was the last version of the paper, Lighthouse Informer, published in Charleston. They changed the name to the Lighthouse Informer, uh, and they eventually moved to Columbia, uh, on December 7th, 1941, a very famous day, they published uh, the first paper in Columbia. Um, and so, uh, McRae's, um, uh, you know, one major goal in the early days was to persuade African Americans to join the NAACP and to join the fight um, uh, and to uh, leave a sort of cautious accommodationist stance um, to overcome this fear, um, essentially. Um, but to do that, the paper, of course, had to gain a readership. There was already an uh, African-American newspaper in, the, in South Carolina, in Columbia, in Columbia, called the Palmetto Leader. It was mostly church and society news. Majeska Simpkins called it a church newspaper. Um, so how do you turn the Lighthouse and Informer into a paper that people read? And they also wanted it to be statewide as well. Um, and so... My, uh, you know, I was pushed as part of a, in the peer review for my manuscript to show that this paper not only made the arguments that I said it made, but that it had an impact, that it really did reach the community, did it, that it did help build a movement. Can you find ways to show that? And so I went back into the archives and dug through the paper. There are a limited number of editions available and came up with some examples of how I thought the paper was connecting with the public and also the way the public, as much as I could find out, was actually debating some of the arguments made in the paper. And I want to start not with its explicit political arguments, but actually with its society pages, because I think they're really important. This is the paper in uh, Columbia. I can't, I'll learn this one day. Let me start first with, uh, as I said, it was launched December 7th, 1941. Um, and so the war effort is something that the Lighthouse and Informer actually sort of engaged in. In early 1942, it did a special edition, South Carolina Negroes Go to War. It did not use the double V logo or the double V language, um, but it did um, uh, create articles. You can see the articles in the archives that, that deliver the same message. Um, we're fighting for our rights overseas, and we also should be fighting for our rights here at home as well. Um, that there should be victory abroad and victory here at home as well. And after that special edition ran, it also began every week during the war running um, Our Boys in Service, all of these names of African Americans who were fighting in the war, who were in the military in some way. It was another way to get the names of African Americans in the paper from communities all over the state and to encourage people to actually subscribe to the newspaper. Um, Let's see if we can keep this going. About the society columns that I mentioned, the uh, Lighthouse and Informer had a sort of a social column, but it ran uh, news and notes items throughout the paper. It had um, uh, little notes items from towns, communities, crossroads across the state. 
Chester, Florence, uh, uh, Aiken, uh, Sherall, uh, Greenville, small towns, big towns, what have you. And it had correspondents who would send in these little notes about who's doing what. Um, and I took a closer look at those. And I think I, you know, I made an argument that actually those columns were instrumental in connecting the newspaper and making it an essential read, a weekly read for um, families, African American families across the state. Um, as, I, as I say, the um, paper society column served as a type of social media for black communities across the state. Each week, correspondents from big cities, small towns, and rural crossroads sent in items about the comings and goings of local folk. Just one example from January 1943, uh, the city's Sherraw correspondent noted, Miss Virginia Talley of New York City was in town visiting her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Talley, while the Aiken Stringer reported that Mrs. Essie Mason is visiting relatives in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Janie Boosie has returned to Philadelphia after being called to Aiken by the death of her father, Mr. James G. Boosie. And on and on it went from, t from town and city uh, across, the, across the state. As I say, each week, the names and hometowns of dozens, some, on some weeks hundreds, of black South Carolinians peppered the pages of the Lighthouse and Informer. And these brief society notes provided an informal geography of the Great Migration and documented the ongoing interaction between North and South. Thousands of black South Carolinians had moved North in search of jobs to escape Jim Crow, yet they maintained close ties with their original communities. By chronicling these interactions so closely on its news pages, the Lighthouse and Informer created a personal bond with readers and cemented its ties with churches, schools, and local organizations that formed the core of black civic life in South Carolina in the 1940s. Perhaps more than any particular editorial comment, it was this commitment to small-time, hyper-local journalism that paved the way for the Lighthouse and Informer to organize and mobilize black Carolinians in the political fight it had. And also, they also used, the paper also used, God, subscriber notes ran by, the, usually a, a lot by the society columns, by the small notes columns, and they would note who is subscribed to the paper, who in that town was subscribing again, creating this sense of, you know, you really want to be reading this paper. Uh, and um, the subscriber notes sort of changed. They'd put new subscribers some weeks. They'd list all the subscribers other weeks. Um, and they'd list subscribers from different towns. But this was important, too, in the papers um, working with the NAACP. It provided a mailing list that the NAACP used to connect with towns all over the state, to call for mass meetings, to inform the public what it was doing outside of the newspaper. It was an important organizing tool uh, as, it, as the paper went forward. Um, as I said, the Lighthouse and Informer, gosh, the Lighthouse and Informer, early in the early 40s, explicitly identified its role one of its first papers published in Columbia um, uh, said, you know, it announced plans for a statewide mass meeting, or several mass meetings actually, to discuss plans to bring a new social order to South Carolina, one where all blacks are working together without, where all races, excuse me, are working together without fear or discrimination. Encouraging black South Carolinians, it did encourage black South Carolinians to subscribe to the Lighthouse and Informer so that all of us can read its pages and know what, it's, what is taking place, place amongst our group in this state. Don't learn about what has happened after it has happened. The Lighthouse and Informer will keep you informed. A new day is just ahead for us. So that's the more explicit, um, explicitly reaching out um, uh, uh, for support and for political support. Um, but McRae's primary goal was also to advocate for black assertive, assertiveness. In other words, to change the tone of leadership in the state and to uh, encourage um, African Americans to join the NAACP and be willing to challenge uh, some of the laws in the state in the courts. Uh, in the early 40s, mid 40s, uh, McRae's a newspaper ran an editorial in which he said, and this is a, 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 an example, there were many like this, 
in which he said it's time for African Americans to rebel and fight for their rights, to reject the slavery of thought and action that created Uncle Tom's and Aunt Jemima's and become progressive fighters for the emancipation of the race. And McCray tried to set an example for that willingness to rebel and fight through some of his news coverage, some surprisingly, surprisingly aggressive news coverage. Um, in uh, 1943, he delivered, reported an expose, really, on treatment of African Americans. Oh. Yeah. oh, God, I am going way too fast. Okay. Okay, you got it. Let's keep going here. I keep, I'll learn this thing at some point. Um, uh, an expose on um, prison, on uh, both prison farm labor uh, and uh, chain gang labor in the state. Uh, and actually showed not only were, uh, had uh, prisoners been injured, but one had died. Um, and McRae, this is early in the tenure of the newspaper, and McRae sent... Um, uh, was deeply worried because white officials were complaining about this. And uh, a court, a local judge, a city judge, says, you know, the Lighthouse Informer has done more than a thousand other things I can think of to agitate content, uh, conditions in the state. Um, um, and McCrae was worried because they talked about putting him before a grand jury. Not quite sure why. There's no way to exactly what they were going to charge him with, but they were going to put him in, for, in front of a jan grand jury. And so he started asking for help, and one of the people he asked was the editor of the Atlanta Daily World, C.A. Scott, famously conservative editor of the Atlanta Daily World, and his response was not what McCrae wanted to hear, because he said, uh, frankly, I think our best strategy as a minority group is to take a more positive attitude and to avoid provocative statements. And so, but McCrae and the NAACP in South Carolina went in the other direction. What McCrae actually did um, as I showed you in the previous slide, was send this letter out to all subscribers of the Lighthouse Informer. And he argued for, um, he asked them, what, do you, what kind of paper do you think we should be? Um, and he got uh, a lot of interesting responses uh, in support of it, um, including this one. I'll just end with this one, and we'll, we'll pick up with questions. But um, this soldier writing from Camp Pickett, Virginia, is obviously a South Carolina soldier, says that um, they've been getting the, uh, the papers on time and by the time it has been here for a couple of hours, it's completely worn out. All the fellows are reading it. But the fellows, the fellows seem to like it, but what puzzles them is how it is that you're still alive. <laughs> um, and there was a, a lot of support and debate, and well, I'll open it up for questions. I went a little long there to start with. Okay, let's open, the, let's open this session up for questions now. Why don't you guys maybe come up here to you could ask questions to these folks. Turn that off. Ken has a question to start us off here. Yes, let me start it off. Uh, and a couple of you can perhaps address this question. So if you're looking at uh, these primary sources as being essentially the voices of the voices, the voices of those who are not heard. So how confident are you that they really are the voices that are not heard rather than limited voices that aren't representative or more representative? You have to be very careful um, um, in, in what you choose because, um, and you have to be kind of smart and wily about it um, and take into consideration, you know, if you're looking um, in Dr. King's papers and you're hearing from uh, white people that are going to have a point of view, they're motivated to write for one reason or another. Uh, when I'm looking, um, uh, I mean, I was when I was using uh, Thomas Waring's papers in, in Charleston. At times, I got so upset about what I was reading, I'd have to get up and walk around the block. Um, and there was, I mean, so you, you he's he's receiving uh, mail from people who have a, a specific point of view. Um, so you, you have to, I think, temper it. I mean, you cannot assume that that's entirely representative. And that you have to, I think, go out of your way to try to find um, as many, you know, different sources of sentiment as possible. You can correlate it to some degree with opinion research at the time, which is interesting, as most of the whites went against the marginal Washington view. Uh, but I like to look at um, 
voices that are actually engaging the media or engaging a specific event um, that gain widespread attention, a salient event, if you will. Uh, but I don't know that you can really tell if this is a representative sample. Uh, and I really don't have a ton of confidence in my generalization that um, that uh, photojournalism and print still was really important, perhaps more important than TV, because of that sample bias. So I'm just going to say, when I write, I was surprised to found, find how much print journalism was still. Uh, then they're sending in articles to substantiate what they, what they, uh, uh, or illustrate. You know, this says better than I, sort of thing. In the case of uh, Rosemary Harris, I think she's just one voice. Um, I think how many uh, women might have been raped and how many African American women men were brutalized. I think she's just one voice. Obviously, of many, we know that. I mean, that's common knowledge. Um, I wish that it had been um, this this statement that she made to the local NAACP chapter. I wish it had been in her own hand. Um, the only document in the microfilm uh, that I scanned was this typewritten. Um, document. And so I, I wonder if maybe she didn't say this to an NAACP worker, or maybe she hand wrote it and then they transcribed it. I, I would have loved to have seen her hand. Yeah. I did, you don't see many letters that I would show you, even if I'd done the whole thing, that um, you won't see many letters because McCrae, the editor of this paper, was not clearly not interested in using the paper as a forum for the whole community to debate, to debate issues. It was an advocacy paper for one particular strategy or path forward. His letters, when he ran letters, they were often from NAACP allies and running them pushing the same point that he was pushing. But you could look, you could see some debates by see some of the letters that he would receive that he didn't run or through, um, there was once where he sort of had to, uh, uh, they, were, they were actually um, denouncing a letter from an Elks Club member, uh, African American Elks Club that was central, obviously a central social um, uh, location in town. Uh, but there had been a definite big debate within the Elks Club among those who were still Republicans and those who had wanted to join McRae and moving toward the Democratic Party. But he didn't just, he would not run just uh, opposing points of view from the community in his paper. He just, he didn't do it. Yes, go, go. So then if you have those concerns about the letters not being representative or the, the sources not being representative, how have they been received by those who evaluate the research that you're trying to publish? Do they raise those questions, I guess, is the question. Nobody's read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first three people who've seen it. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> I think that if we can tell a compelling story with identifiable characters mm -hmm. and corroboration of some form or another, yeah. uh, our reconstruction of reality is mm -hmm. going to rise or fall based on how persuasive a public is. So you really actually don't really know for a few years. I mean, your peer reviewers are only. But I think also it, it, it depends on how you state the claim. So um, I would certainly not, um, uh, based on um, what I saw in Charlottesville, uh, conclude that um, all white people in Richmond were having, uh, were beginning to have in the mid 1940s, you know, somewhat softer feelings about Africa. Americans. I mean, I would not do that. But what I do know is that there were, um, you know, at least, uh, I mean, there were some, some other letters that took a completely different uh, perspective, but I could, I could state that some white residents of Richmond in the 1940s were beginning to question Jim Crow. And I could cite for some you know, these examples, and they were reaching out to their newspaper. Now, one thing that I noticed was that the people who were uh, inclined to write him, uh, you had the, the woman who said for the honor of Virginia or whatever, uh, you know, she was um, hearing a lecture at a, at a college, um, and, you know, the woman who wrote to the bus company, you know, she was, you know, somebody who was going to work. 
Um, and then we have the doctor's family. You know, these were um, these were not these were people who were educated. These were people who were um, uh, middle class or more. Um, so I, I would also, if I were to use these, have to say that this is a very limited. I just, this is a piggyback on mm -hmm. Ken's question, uh, and maybe one of you can answer this because you were citing some sources. But I wonder, it seemed, has there been, have there been bibliographic essays on the state of archival work having to do with evidence that would represent voices? Because that, I, I guess what I'm talking about here is the distinction between uh, storytelling and good journalism and scholarship mm -hmm. that may, uh, so as a piggyback, if there's been that kind of stuff, I'd really be interested that I'm on a citation or two. And secondly, uh, how much do you feel compelled as a researcher in these fields to say, let me state at the front just how tough it is to right. find this kind of evidence because that's community, the community in its own life, right? right? We can't find letters to the other. We, we can't get diaries. Mm -hmm. uh, I bring this up because one of the, when I retired, I got very interested in family research. And I was astonished in a very positive way at the amount of stuff I was able to find in newspaper archives right. about my relatives. But it was only thank God because of the Atlanta Journal of Constitution going back and, and having, I mean, I don't know if any, how many of you have read some of the incredible work that was done for the 25th anniversary, the 50th mm -hmm. anniversary of the Civil War. But there's just wonderful stuff, archival stuff. But So the question, two questions, are there bibliographic essays that say, you know, if you're trying to figure out what uh, the public uh, the voices, the stakeholders in the civil rights movement or this event mm -hmm. thought or have to say, let me tell you up front, uh, about all you're going to find is, is scattered anecdotal stuff. Right. And I think if you, if you, if you provide the disclaimer, um, right. yeah, that um, gives you a little bit of uh, insulation. As far as the bibliographic essays, uh, I cannot point you to specifically to something, but I do know, you know, the bottom up history movement, you know, that came out of the 1960s, this is your area. Um, Here's you. <laughs> um, is that the keyword search one with new bottom up history? Yeah, I, I oh, think, okay. yeah, that, I mean, I, I think uh, it's not uh, really there. I mean, the Lawrence Levine essay is excellent. It's about popular culture. Right. Most people working on audience and mm -hmm. uh, other people are right. yeah, talking yeah. about audiences. Like Susan Douglas, you know, in, in mm -hmm. feminism and media, but there's really not a lot. Yeah, I'd like to find those places and those voices that are connected. Um, Kathy Ford mentions this, mentioned this morning the ecology of communication. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good metaphor. Uh, much of the scholarship really does move in one direction and say, here's all this coverage of these dramatic events, and it turned into sympathetic, popular, overwhelming opinion, which turned into legislation. Uh, and in the in between spaces, there are debates, and that's what history is. It's an argument, um, and it was definitely a heated argument. And most people, including the president, didn't think nonviolence was worth it. So Thank again, you. so I have a question, sort of to piggyback off of all of this. It's all about motivation. I mean, I heard you mention it a little bit earlier, when, um, in terms of people who are writing and particularly about complaints, are motivated to do so. And I can't help but think in like modern day society when you can even imagine comment forms, <laughs> et cetera. And the question is, so I spent, when I first started doing my research, I spent some significant amount of time in the FCC archives reading a lot of complaints about what local areas yeah. were doing. And one thing I noticed was, I mean, I don't want to say absurd, but it was the the it was there were very interesting complaints that were being written, and I'm talking about like seven pages where, with an addendum addendum where they've decided to do an art piece and a drawing, and you're like, wow, 
And I'm just thinking, but how indicative of this is, of the silent majority, if you would. I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem viable. And so I'm wondering, how do you navigate that motivation? And what do you do? You really want to tell that story, right? That person who spent so much time. But what utility is it of trying to get to that silent I think body it, of consumers? I think Tom's use of the word correlation is not a bad one. I mean, you do have to correlate it against other evidence you have and, and see, does this, is this a plausible, can I make an argument that I can defend that this is representative of some chunk of, of the community, you know, and can I defend it? And I, you know, and peer reviewers, I assume, I mean, I try to, are looking at it and going, is this argument plausible? You know, is there enough evidence? Can I really find the evidence that shows that this is representative of the community? Beyond that, I'm not sure there is a hard and fast, um, you know, I'm, final way to do it. I suggest also um, I've done a fair amount of work with discourse analysis, and um, one of the things that um, you can uh, get a pass on um, in terms of reviewers is if you um, set your uh, analysis up in terms of discourse and frame it um, as you know, as Foucault tells us, I am looking for patterns and you know repetitions and, and these kinds of things. And so you don't have to quantify and you don't have to, but you, I mean, to be intellectually honest, of course you do have to say, you know, I only found, you know, three letters in the FCC. Uh, but you can, um, if you are looking for patterns, particularly if you're working across archives um, and seeing the same thing showing up. It's particularly problematic with the FCC because so much of it's been destroyed. And so you have like cumulative purges to where even the people will say, well, the only reason that exists is because I happen to tell them whenever they're throwing everything else away, you know, you really shouldn't throw that away. But a lot of the other stuff right. was thrown away. Yeah. So quantitative, I, I, I couldn't even imagine trying to become right. some people which you want to do. Mm -hmm. Again, I try to favor the connective Pieces. There's a, a wonderful letter from uh, a leader of New York City's Black uh, Firemen's Union, the Walton Society, uh, saying we deplore the use of firemen in, uh, and they send a hundred bucks, right? Oh, wow. And he references, hey, Jackie Robinson is really behind us. He went down there, and Malcolm X is wrong that you know using children is 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 immoral. And by the way, uh, I've sent this, and you see it in the Amsterdam News a story about the Vulcan Society's meeting and its contribution, right? And the answer in news takes Jackie Robinson's side, right, about the use of children. Uh, and it's sort of those nodes, right, uh, of communication where they catch, actually capture ordinary or semi-ordinary people. This guy's a leader of, a, of, this, of this black union, but, you know, that, it, it just helps fill in uh, between national and local. Yeah. Um, agency and it's not just a passive reading or consuming public it's, it's people are really engaged so we're just after four o'clock one more quick question maybe really short if anyone has a question a quick one yeah. um, the husband that you were writing and reading about henry lester uh lester harris the husband yes the the one who was beating his wife no, no, i'm sorry not the husband the, oh lieutenant the dorsey officer. henry dorsey henry yeah Dor did you find or did you look to see he said he was instated and he worked another 15 years mm -hmm. did you find if any other charges were brought against him in that 15 years i did not see anything else but i, I was able to uh, i went to the mayor's office in new iberia when i was there and you know hung out with her and it turns out it was her dad who was mayor at the time okay. who wow. sided with the naacp and he was also named in that violation of civil rights suit as a defendant. I was like, wow. And so then I asked her, what happened to Dorsey? Can you show me these records? Well, the police department was done away with. It's all part of the sheriff's department in the parish now. And so a lot of those records are missing. Um, so I couldn't go dig up his personnel file or anything like that. Because um, my, my journalist FOIA brain kicked out. I'm like, well, get his personnel file. But um, I didn't see anything else in the court records. And then the mayor talked to her old pal, the judge, who was the judge at the time. And he said, yes. Lieutenant Dorsey, we knew he was bad news, and for most of the rest of those 15 years, he was in the courtroom working kind of the security sort of bailiff stuff, and then he retired. So I felt really comfortable using that based on the fact that this judge 
um, you know, was working at the time. Thank you. Thank you very much.